We are so excited that you decided to join us online today. My name is Hope Harness and I'm going to be your host today. That church exists to know Jesus and make him known everywhere. We are one church in two physical locations, Cabot and Sherwood, Arkansas. Thank you for joining us online. We are excited about the message today, so let's jump into it. Acts chapter 2 is an interesting point in the Bible because it's a fundamental narrative shift. All of a sudden, you go from the physical life of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this God-man who lived, died, and then lived again. Then, all of a sudden, it shifts. Jesus has died, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. He's left, and the disciples are here now trying to spread the good news to the world. God knew this would be a challenge for them, so he issued a portion of himself onto earth. And that portion of himself came with signs and wonders and incredible miracles. This portion of God's self would come to be known as the Holy Spirit. And Acts chapter 2 is marked as the day of Pentecost the day that the Holy Spirit descended on earth. And with this new and renewed spirit, the disciples would carry the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. Man, carry the message of Christ to the world. How important that is. And what a great opportunity it is. And I think about this and I think about God has given us his presence. And so many times we're so consumer focused about our lives. What can God do for me? How can God make my life better? How can I have a better marriage? How can I have, be thinner, or prettier? How can I be faster? How can I like myself better? And listen, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with those desires, but I'm going to tell you, if that's the only way that you come to God, you're missing the big picture. The big picture isn't that God entered into this world so you could feel better about you, but God came into this world to give you an opportunity to carry out the greatest mission in human history. You have an opportunity to be a part of God's rescue mission of our world. And, and let me tell you something, that's not a small matter. It's a big matter. And we needed help to do it. In fact, Acts chapter eight, chapter one, rather in verse eight, it says that when my, when the spirit has come upon you, you'll receive power and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the uttermost. And uh, I had a conversation with my son this week and we were talking about this and he said, you know, I'm feeling a call to be a missionary. I said, where? He said, somewhere in the world. I said, I want you to think about this for a second. That's great. I think you should. But don't overlook where you are. I said, are you in Jerusalem? He said, no. I said, you in Judea? He said, no. You in Samaria? He said, no. I said, so of those places that God said you're going to go to, which one of them are we in? He said, I guess the uttermost. I said, that's where we're at. You're already on a mission field. I'm not saying you shouldn't go. We should go. But here's what I am going to tell you. You and I are on the mission field right now. This is the mission field. You're among the uttermost people right now. You, you have this opportunity and this privilege as God has given it to us. He's called us to it. He's commissioned us to it. And He's filled us with His Spirit. This message series, The Real Ghost Story, we're talking about the Holy Spirit and we're talking about how He empowers us to carry out God's mission. And today we're going to talk about probably one of the most misunderstood aspects of the Holy Spirit. This portion that I'm going to talk to you about, and I'm not even going to get to the, the gifts portion of it, but we're going to talk about spiritual gifts. I'm not even going to get the gifts portion because it's so misunderstood. And remember what I told you when we started this conversation, and really this is as always, we're going to let the Bible be our guide. And so I'm going to share with you things that, that may not fit the experiences that you've been, or maybe they don't fit the traditions that you came from. That church is a collection of people from a lot of different backgrounds. But when it comes to the issue of the Holy Spirit, what he does and the gifts he brings, we're going to let the Bible say what it says. And then if I'm incorrect, then you have to share scripture with me how I'm incorrect, just not in this service. Okay, but you, you can share that. Just want to be clear. It's not interactive. I don't have time. So, so let's talk about spiritual gifts. Let me tell you what spiritual gifts are according to God's word. Spiritual gifts are abilities that are given to you. You didn't learn this yourself. It's not a talent. Um, it's not something that, that you, you learned. It's not something you naturally had, but it's something that's given to you by the Holy Spirit that does three things. They make Jesus known, they give God the glory, and they help the church. That's what spiritual gifts do. They do those three things. And I'm going to unpack those three things and we'll dig into them deep, deeper and see what we, what we need to understand about them. And so for us to understand spiritual gifts, I think we have to understand the Holy Spirit. And so the first point, if you're filling in blanks, write this down. If I'm going to understand spiritual gifts, it has to start with God first. I have to start there. I can't start with me. This is a mistake we make. Many times we look at ourselves and we'll ask questions like, where am I gifted? 
What has God gifted me in? How am I special? How am I something important? How, how am I significant? That's not what a spiritual gift is. A spiritual gift is God going to do his, he's doing, going to do his mission through you. It's his gift through you so that he'll receive the glory. It's not a self-serving, self-promoting deal. So we have to start with God first. The Bible starts there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says, in the beginning, God. So we're going to start with God because that's the only way we can understand this. That's, that's where we start always, by the way, is we always start with God. And so we're going to start with him first. And so let's talk about this a little bit. The Holy Spirit brings gifts first to reveal Jesus. That's what he comes for. Matter of fact, in John chapter 15 and verse 26, this is Jesus speaking. Here's what he said. He said, but I will send to you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and he will testify about me. Jesus said the Holy Spirit's going to tell you about me. He's going to testify about me. All the gifts of the Spirit do exactly the same thing. Every gift of the Spirit is a testimony and it's about Jesus. It's not about me. Spiritual gifts isn't about how spiritual I am. Spiritual gifts are not about a spiritual pecking order. Oh, he's got this, the, the gift of whatever, so he must be really spiritual. It's not like that at all. Spiritual gifts have nothing to do with us except for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the one who brings the gifts. So how, it's like me taking credit for my eye color. Oh, you've got really pretty eyes. Oh, well, thank you. I, I really worked hard for those. You know, one day I just only had one, and then I just kept working the other one. There it was. It's awesome. No, it's, we don't get any, it's not ours. It's the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That, that, that he brings those in our life. And so, so they're, they're not about us, but, but he gives them to us so it will reveal Christ. One of the earliest gifts that we see on, like around the day of Pentecost is the gift of tongues. Gift of tongues is the ability to speak in a language that you haven't learned. That's the gift of tongues. And so, in other words, when, when God released his Holy Spirit and he was opening our eyes to this fact that he was going to reach the entire world with the gospel... He gave the people who knew the truth about Jesus the, the ability to speak to people in languages they had not learned. And so you have the gift of tongues. Then you have the gift of interpretation. What's the gift of interpretation? That's when someone speaks and he's speaking to a crowd of people that doesn't know his language that he's speaking to them, but they understand it in their language. It happened on the day of Pentecost. Matter of fact, Peter, when he got up to speak in Acts chapter 2, if you'll remember, he spoke to this crowd of people. And when he spoke to this crowd of people, the Bible says they were from all different languages and backgrounds. The Bible says they all heard it in their own language. That's the gift of interpretation. And so we have these gifts. Why do we have these gifts? We have them so that the gospel can go forward. The gift of tongues was also given as a sign gift. Because before that, the Jews were those who had been entrusted with the truth about God. God was working through them from a covenant all the way back to a man named Abraham. And so before this, it seemed as if the Gentiles were outside of God's covenant. So it was just the Jews. But what God was actually doing was assembling for himself a group of people that he would use as a royal priesthood to spread the gospel to all the world. On the day of Pentecost, when God began to unveil what Paul calls his mysterious plan, and he began to let everyone in the world know about the gospel, which, by the way, was God's plan from the beginning. We just wasn't in on it. And so on the day of Pentecost, and from that point forward in the book of Acts, you can read from chapter 2 on, you'll see where God begins to reach the Gentile people, which to the Jewish people before that, they would thought, no, they're outside of God's covenant. We're, we're His people. God doesn't want a relationship with everybody. He just wants a relationship with us. God said, no, I want a relationship with everybody. I just started with you. You're, you're the starting point. But to prove that the, the Gentiles were receiving the Holy Spirit and that God was doing what He said He would do, they had the ability to speak, speak in tongues. It wasn't gibberish. It was an actual language they hadn't learned. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a sign except for when someone who's never learned French can speak French, you could say something happened, right? That's a miracle. That's, that's a sign. That's what took place back then. So the Holy Spirit brings the gifts to reveal Jesus. Secondly, the Holy Spirit brings gifts to give God the glory. Now, here's the issue with giving God the glory. What does it mean to give God the glory? To give God the glory means is where God is recognized and He's appreciated for who he is. That's what it means to give God the glory. Look at this, verse 12. There's so much more I want to tell you. This is Jesus speaking. He says, but I can't bear it now. I can't give it to you right now. He goes on. He says, when the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you to all truth. There's this relationship that we see happening in the New Testament where when we have the Bible, the 66 books of the compiled Bible that you and I have today, uh, the, we call this the word of truth. So you have the word of truth and you have the spirit of truth. These two begin to work together. 
And we're going to see when the Holy Spirit and the word of truth begin to work together, there's a knowledge that we couldn't have had otherwise. And so Jesus said, and you got to think he's there in the flesh in front of these guys. He said, there's things I want to share with you, but you can't know it. You can't know it yet. And, and so imagine, if you will, even the apostles themselves, there was their, their knowledge of, of God's plan and who God is was incomplete. They didn't know what you and I know. I want you to think about that for a second. Even Peter, how incredible he was, or the, even the apostle Paul, how amazing he was, didn't know everything you know. You, you have the compiled word of God. You have the truth of God's word, and you have the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth living in you. These two come together to fulfill our knowledge. Jesus said, while I'm here in front of you, you, you know part of what's going on. You see me in the flesh, but that's not all of it. You and I know both about God in the future we know about prophecies. We know about eternity. There are things we know that the, the New Testament writers didn't actually know. They only knew in part. But we know in full because we have the revealed Word of God and we have the Spirit of truth living in us. Man, that's incredible. On one hand, you go, that's awesome. But on the other hand, you have to understand it comes with great responsibility. To whom much is given, much is expected, is what the Scripture says very clearly. So he brings gift to bring, to bring God the glory. The Holy Spirit brings gifts to help God's family. Help God's family. So each of you should use whatever gift you have, you have received to serve others. To serve others. Spiritual gifts are a lot of things, but one of the things that they're not, they're not self-serving. We have not been given a spiritual gift to serve ourselves. A spiritual gift is an ability God has given you to make Jesus known, to give God the glory, and to serve others. That's why I tell people this consistently. You, you need to be careful when you say, God has gifted me in this particular area of my life, but you don't use it within the context of the church. In fact, I would say if you're not serving in the church, then whatever gift you have that you think you have, you may not actually have it. Because the truth is, is that we were given a gift to benefit mutually other believers. You're going to see that more and more as we go through this. We're supposed to be building up the body of Christ. This is our eternal family. This is my contribution to the eternal family. I need to know how God's gifted me. Or I need, and I'll show you how to, to come to that conclusion in a minute. But I need to know how God's gifted me. I need to be expressing that so others are growing up in Christ as well. He says, to each of you, you should use whatever gift you have, to re have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very word of God. If anyone serves, he should serve and do so with the strength that God provides. So in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ, to whom the glory and the power forever and ever. And I will point one thing out. Spiritual gifts are not permanent either. There's an idea that you, you have a spiritual gift and you always have it. You don't always have that same spiritual gift. I have seen people enter into ministry and service and have incredible like words of knowledge like their understanding of Scripture, or maybe their ability to counsel, step out of ministry, and it's like it goes away. And so, so the idea that you have a spiritual gift and you'll always have that spiritual gift, that, that's not actually true because we don't see that in Scripture. And, and how I've seen it played out is that you have that gift and you have the gift that you need when you need it. And I'll, and I'll, I'll make an argument in a minute. I don't want to jump into that yet. I'll make an argument in a minute that all the spiritual gifts are available to every one of us. Okay, it's not, you're not just, not just one gift is available to you. In fact, it's a weird thing to have this idea that you've got this one spiritual gift and all the spiritual gifts are not available to you if they're needed. So God, the Holy Spirit lives in you. You have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We've already learned that we didn't get a part of the Holy Spirit. We got all the Holy Spirit. So if I have all the Holy Spirit, then I have all the resources of the Holy Spirit available to me, right? Doesn't that make sense? And remember, the spiritual gift isn't, isn't about you. It's about the Holy Spirit. So if, if it's needed, if there's something needed in the church or there's something need God needs me to do to bring glory to His name, to make Jesus known, to serve the church, don't you think He can give that to me? He can. He can. It brings me to my second point. This is a really important one. Um, is you need to know what's needed rather than what you think you have. For years as a church, I went by the traditions of what I saw other pastors do. And what I saw other pastors do, and what I was the prevailing thought, is you do a spiritual gift test. I don't know if y'all have ever been through one of those. You do a spiritual gift test. They give us the heebie-jeebies now, and here's why. Is that spiritual gift test tells you that you're gifted in a certain area, and then what we would have to do is try to figure out how to craft the ministry around your gifting. And a lot of times religious people who come to that church are like from a religious background. They'll come in, they'll go, hey, I just want you to know I have the gift of whatever it is. You know, I've got the gift of administration. I've got the gift of 
you know, holy basket weaving or something. They've got some kind of gift. We, they would expect us to craft the ministry to fit their spiritual gift. Now, that doesn't make sense if you really think about it from a practical standpoint. What you need to start with first is what's needed. What's needed within the church? And then whatever's needed, can I tell you something? God will qualify you for it. He'll, he'll make it. He'll, there are things you'll be able to do because of the Spirit of God that you couldn't do before. I'm, I'm a prime example of that, okay? So go all the way back to my college years. I took a speech class when I was in college. Um, I didn't know that I was called to be a pastor when I was in college. I take a speech class. It was required. When I did my speech class, I had a five-minute message I had to give. I don't even remember what I gave it on, to be honest with you. But in like 47 seconds, I told them everything I knew. I, had, I, was, out of, I was out of content. And I just hung my head and went to my seat. I mean, I was just so dejected. And it was awful. My, my, my speech teacher was actually super kind to me. And she said, I'm gonna, she said, I know you've tried. She said, I, I see it. She said, I see the work you've put in. She said, you're just not cut out for this. And she said, and I mean, she was super nice. And she just told me, she said, whatever you do, just make sure you don't do anything where you have to speak publicly. And I'm like, amen. And she passed me in that class. And I went on to the next one. I was like, thank God. In my mind, I was like, never speak publicly. And then God starts dealing with me about being a pastor. I'm like, that's crazy. I'm having hallucinations. This is crazy. There's no way. Why? I've already been through speech class. I leaned into that speech class so many times. When I was talking to God, I was like, God, come on. You're driving me crazy. There's no way. Speech class, don't you remember? Because I would, and even when I got into the church, I remember they would have all these books and they'd say, look at what God has gifted you in. And look at how he's, his fingerprints are on your life. And, and you look at that, and that oftentimes tells you what God wants you to do. And I would, I would be like, okay, well, speech isn't one of them. So I just discount that every single time. I'm like, I can't be. I can't talk publicly. I just get all jumbled up. I can't do it. But then you know what God does by his Holy Spirit? He, he qualifies the unqualified. He doesn't call. Think about how many people in the Bible were qualified when God called them. The apostle Paul wasn't an apostle until after God called him. David wasn't a king. He was a shepherd boy until God called him. Noah never built a boat in his life until God called him. Abraham was not a sojourner. He wasn't a leader until, until God called him. Moses certainly wasn't a leader. He was hiding in the wilderness until God called him. And what I realize is, is that the Scripture teaches us very clearly, and I, I think it's a, a, a matter of God's glory and power, and it's also a way to keep us humble is that God calls us out of what makes us comfortable, what we're able to do on our own. He calls us out of that, and He equips us to do something else so that we'll know, number one, He's the one doing the work, and we'll be reminded of that. And, and, and then number two, it, it, it gives Him glory because people go, I remember that dude. He was a knucklehead. He was terrible at that, but how's, how's that even working? God, that's how it's working. That's how spiritual gifts, um, that's how spiritual gifts work. Look at this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7, it says a spiritual gift is given to each. Now, by the way, it says a spiritual gift. I believe they're given one at a time. I do believe that that's true. I'm not going to argue this. Well, I would argue it with you, but not right now. But I believe the spiritual gifts that God gives are available. I want to say this. When you go through the list of spiritual gifts in the Bible, I believe that's an incomplete list as well. I believe God will give you whatever you need to do whatever he's asked you to do. So having your saying, okay, spiritual gifts are limited to this one little list we try to compile. Because by the way, unlike spiritual fruit, spiritual gifts are kind of in a few different places and there's a few different names for them. And it's, I have people that, that, that have gone through and that like I'm listing all the gifts that have been listed. If you'll notice, the list is never the same when it's listed more than once in Scripture. That tells me that the spiritual gifts, that list isn't all of it. That's just some of it. Whatever you need, the Holy Spirit has whatever it takes to accomplish it, right? If God's called you to do something, the Holy Spirit will give you whatever you need to do it. He can, even if you didn't learn it, He can give it to you. Even if you didn't, even if that ain't your bend, I'm not that, kind, I'm not that gal. Well, God can make you that gal. He can. He can, he can do it. So the Holy Spirit can do that. And, he, and, and we can operate in different spiritual gifts at different times. We really can. Um, I've had the opportunity to do counseling. When the church first started, I was not a counselor. God qualified me to counsel, and he gave me what I needed. There would be times people would talk. I remember sitting down with people. I remember this so vividly. They're telling me something that's happening in their life, and in my mind, I'm going, oh, my gosh, I have no idea. 
And I don't want to look shocked. They just told me something horrible is happening. I'm like, I don't want to go, you know, you can't do that as a counselor. You've got to go, yes. Yes. In my mind, I'm like, holy cow, over your head. I got no idea. They would finish the sentence and God would have something to say to them that I wanted to write down. It was so good. I was like, that is so good. I need to write that down. That is so good. I'm sorry, I'm telling you this, but hold on. I need to, so I can remember this. I mean, that's how the spirit works. And that's what God does. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. Everybody has a contribution. And by the way, that spiritual gift shows up when you say, yes, Lord. And it doesn't show up before. It doesn't show up before because it requires faith. Remember, it requires faith to please God. So you have to say, okay, God, I'm willing. And then when you say you're willing, then God gives you what you need. But he doesn't give it to you beforehand. And so the spiritual gifts that we need are there. Um, And he goes through this list of spiritual gifts. And it's interesting that if you don't look at spiritual gifts as a tool that God's given you to, to, to do the work that God's given you, instead you look at yourself as a mechanic that just has one tool. And, and that's what we used to do. We'd give a spiritual gift test. It was our own fault. And people take a test like, I've got the gift of this. And they go through life thinking that's the one gift. That, so like, think about you're a mechanic. You work on cars. And you got this one tool, this one wrench. Okay, That's the only wrench you've got is this one. You have to find a car to fit your wrench. You can't just fix every car that comes your way. You've got to find the specific car. Someone says, my car's broken. Can you help me? No, I'm sorry. My wrench doesn't fit that one i got to find one that fits. So you go through life looking for a car to fit your wrench. I've had people say, I used to go to church over there, but I don't go there because they don't fit my gifting. Start with what's needed, not what you think you have. And if you start with what's needed, then God equips us and he prepares you and he gives you what's needed. You would be amazed at what could happen in your life. And I promise you, you will never experience the favor of God like you will when you chase hard after him, serving his people, doing the work that God's asked you to do. And every single one of us have so much more that we could offer if we just unleash the Holy Spirit as He works in our lives. He goes, uh, so he goes on. Let me, let me read this, this last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me point this out. 1 Corinthians, for the most part, so the church at Corinth is a church that... Um, I've compared it to Joe's Bar and Grill a lot because it's like a church that they're just... They're, they're, most of the letters that Paul writes to the Corinthian church, are, he's trying to correct them. They're just screwed up. You know what I'm saying? They got a little bit of knowledge, and then they just kind of get off the rails a bunch. You know, they're just like us, just regular people, and they just don't, they don't really know. And so they, get, they screw things up a lot. So Paul's trying to correct them. Most of First and Second Corinthians is Paul going, hey, don't do that anymore. That's bad. You know, do it this way instead. Um, but specifically, spiritual gifts got them in trouble. And here's how it got them in trouble. Um, the church at Corinth began to experience spiritual gifts. And as they experienced spiritual gifts, they began to get prideful about them. And all of a sudden, they began to compare their gifts. My gift's better than your gift. No, I got a big gift. No, I got a better gift. And then all of a sudden, gifts are just chaos. There's this, you know, this spiritual pecking order. No, I'm more spiritual than you. No, Jesus loves me more than he loves you. I'm better than you. You know, and there's this big argument going on. So Paul says, let me, let me run a comb through all of this. And, and that's what he does, 1 Corinthians 11 and 12. He just runs a comb through spiritual gifts. And he kind of puts order to these spiritual gifts. And he gives us some organization to them. But then he reveals to us something critically important. And this is something that's so funny to me, is that churches will read the first part. They'll think about spiritual gifts, talk about spiritual gifts, and make the same mistakes the church at Corinth made. They'll have a spiritual pecking order because of spiritual gifts. When Paul ends this conversation, here's what he says, the very last thing. This is really important. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 29. So he finishes talking about spiritual gifts. Here's what he says. He says, but now let me show you a way of life that's best of all. You like these spiritual gifts. That's cool. That's good. They're important. God can equip you. That's true. But I want to show you something that's actually really, really more important and valuable than all of that. And he starts into 1 Corinthians 13. And here's what's unfortunate. Pastors took 1 Corinthians 13 and we threw it at every marriage that came our way. Every wedding you've been to is 1 Corinthians 13 unpacking. 1 Corinthians 13 wasn't about marriage. Not about marriage. Yes, you should love each other and it's kind and patient. Yes, that's all true. But he wasn't talking about marriage. He was talking about life. This is what life is supposed to look. The best way for you to live is this way, which brings me to my third point. Know the way that is best of all. If we're going to pursue spiritual gifts, let's know the way that's absolutely the best. In 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 8, he says this. 
Listen to what he says. First sentence, he says, love never fails. Not that it seldom drops the ball, pretty consistent. No, it says it never fails. That's what Paul says. Paul's about to tell you that of all the spiritual giftings that you might want to pursue, of all the things you'd love, special abilities you'd love for God to give to you, all the enhancements that you'd love the Holy Spirit to give to your life, he says, you know what the absolute best thing you have? Love. It's better than all the rest of them. In fact, when Jesus was asked, he said, what's the greatest commandment? What's the most important thing God wants us to do? He says, two parts. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, if you'll love God and you'll love them, then you're going to fulfill. The whole Bible is summed up in this specific text. Love God and love people. Now, I know today, loving people means you accept people and receive what they have to say. That's not loving somebody. Loving somebody, is, is, it has to be coupled with the truth and God's standard. If it doesn't have truth and God's standard, in, you're not really loving them. You're enabling them. And you're sending them down a road that's not good for them. But love means I love God with everything I've got. I love what he says is true. I love his standard that he set because it's good for us. It's holy. It's eternal. It's valuable. I love him and I love you too. And, I, and I'm going to tell you the truth. But I'll still hang on to you, our relationship. And I'm not going to hate you for, because you don't agree with me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bear with you. But I'm, I'm, I'm loving God and I'm loving you. I'm going to be patient with you. I'm going to be kind to you. But I'm still going to tell you the truth because you matter to me. And your eternity is important to me. So I'm, I'm going to care for you in that way. And so Paul says love is, is it. He says, now notice what he says because he's going to compare love to these spiritual gifts. He says, but where there are prophecies, that's when God's knowledge has been revealed through, a, through an individual. Um, we have this in both Old Testament and New. A prophet was a person who spoke on behalf of God. They would give us the word of God um, because we didn't have the word of God for ourselves. We were dependent on certain people listening to God and giving us the word of God. Now, someone says, Scott comes in and he prophesies. No, I don't. I just reveal what's already been revealed. I talk about what's already been. Matter of fact, anytime Scott says something that contradicts what's already been revealed, then Scott is a false prophet. He, he, he's teaching falsehood and heresy. That we have to go back. This is God's, God has revealed himself. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, in diverse time and sundry manners, God spoke to us through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. In other words, God's mic drop was when he sent Jesus. He didn't need to tell us anything else. And we have the complete and full story of Jesus right here. And you have that for yourself. And so many times we're looking for somebody to tell us something that we want to hear when really you need to hear what God has to say. He's already given it to us right here. We just dig into it. We're, we're going to learn it. We're going we're to get that together. But, he says, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Okay, when? When are, when are, when are we not going to need the prophets anymore? Let's keep going. Where there are tongues, the ability to speak in a, for, a different language, they will be still. Okay, when is that? Where, where there is knowledge, that's that special knowledge that we didn't have because we didn't have the counsel of God's word. We didn't have the, true, the, the spirit of truth living in us. He says this, that'll pass away. So well, these things have a life expectancy. They have a shelf life. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. In other words, the prophets only gave you a portion of God's word. When Jeremiah in the Old Testament would stand up or even John the Baptist would stand up, he would give you a portion of what God had to say. He couldn't tell you everything, but you have everything now. So you're not incomplete in any way. It goes on. It says this, we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. Did you hear that? That's what the, the list of what he said. So when the completeness comes, what is in part will disappear. It's going to go away. So in other words, there was a time when we needed Jeremiah the prophet. There, there was a time when prophets were needed, but in the age in which you and I live, we don't, we don't need a prophet today because you have the Word of God. Here's what else is you have the Spirit of God living in you. You don't need me to tell you what God is saying because God lives in you if you're a believer. You have, you have the teacher living in you. You're not dependent on me. We're celebrating together as a church. This is, this is, this is e you, you and I today are equally celebrating what God has said. We're reminding one another of what God said. But you have what God said, and you have God living in you if you're a believer. You don't need me. You don't need somebody else. One of the worst places you can position yourself is position yourself in a place where you think you're dependent on somebody else. You are dependent on Jesus alone, and you have the Spirit of God living in you. They have the truth of God. You, you have it. You have it. You are not incomplete. 
Does that mean that we don't need each other to maybe figure some things out and, and use comp? No, we should. Absolutely, we should. Should we celebrate together as a church and work? Yes, absolutely, we should. But I'm just saying this. The idea that you need somebody to speak words over you, God has spoken over you already if you listen to it. 3,000 promises in this book for you. You don't need some dude that you got to send $29.95 to to send you a magic carpet. You don't need that because you have the Word of God. You have truth already. And you have the Spirit of God living in you. God wants to talk to you directly. He doesn't want to talk through somebody. He don't have to talk to the high priest anymore. He talks to you. The Bible says you can come boldly to God's throne of grace. You're not dependent on any man other than Jesus. And then God wants to talk to you. He does. And Paul said, you know what? This stuff that we're having to deal with today is going to go away. It's going to go away when the completeness has come. There were certain gifts given at the turn of the century when God was documenting. And matter of fact, every time God is going to do something powerful and profound, he would document it with signs, miracles, and wonders. So that's what you see in Acts chapter 1, that first, first portion of the book of Acts. You see where God's documenting what he's doing through these miracles, signs, and wonders. Many of these went away. That's what Paul's talking about. They went away. They don't, they don't exist anymore. And, and, and again, I'm not trying to compare or, or offend anybody, but I want to say this. The apostolic gifts of healing and miracles do not exist today. Does God still heal? Absolutely he does. But he doesn't require it to come through one individual. That proof is not needed anymore. Why? Because we have the self-authenticating word of God. We don't, we don't have to prove anything. God's already proven it. He's already, you already have that. You don't need a miracle to confirm it. Why? Because God's already proven it. And, and here's, what, here's what I'll say. And again, I'm not, I don't want this to come across arrogant. I pray it comes across with humble heart because that's where it is. The apostolic gifts were for a particular time so that God could show he was doing something unique and different. They went away. So here's what I'll say. They know that, Scott, those still exist. When Jesus healed, he went to the cemetery at one point. Do you ever see these guys go to the cemetery? No. You ever see them go to the hospital? They go to tents and different places and circumstances that are obscure. If I'm not saying God doesn't heal because I've seen God heal. You know he heals. The Bible tells us that. But he heals as we ask him and as we pray for it. In the context of the church, he heals. But he doesn't need Pastor Scott healing somebody because Scott's not necessary. God does the work. He doesn't need Bishop so-and-so or Cardinal so-and-so. God's able to do it. You can pray and God brings about miracles in your life. God does the work and he does it. You're not dependent on anybody whatsoever. I've told people this for a long time that will argue this point because they come out of a different background. And I say, well, look, here's the thing. I will be the first to admit it that they're here if we go to Children's Hospital. I'll go with you. And, and I'll be the first one to say, man, apostolic gifts are back. Let's go to Children's Hospital. Let's clear out the burn unit. Let's, let's, let's clear out the, the, the NICU unit. Let's clear out the hospital. Then I'll be the one to go, yep, I was wrong. And I'll, be the, I'll go on camera. I'll go on record. But, I, but I'm not wrong. Because those things don't exist. Now, here's why miracles can't remain. We'll worship and seek after miracles more than we'll worship and seek after God. See, God's not looking for us to be pursuers of miracles. He wants us to pursue Him. Now, miracles documented that God was doing a work. And we have those miracles documented. We have the record of those miracles. We know they happen. The Word of God tells us that they happen. But we do a great disservice to the work of God when we pretend like something is existing when it really doesn't. It just makes us look like a bunch of charlatans. But we're not. God is powerful. He's the creator of all things. He's the resurrector. He is the, he is the Christ. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He's all of those things. But to act like he's doing something that he's not doing undermines everything else. Because when it really comes down to it, that's just a bunch of show, and that's really not, what, not what's going to get us there. Verse 11, Paul goes on to say, he says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. He says, all these things are going to go away. Then he gives us this illustration of being a kid. When the church was young, when the work of God through the church was young, it was like a little kid. There's certain things you have to do when you're a little kid. There's certain things that you'll see and, and perceive. He says, when the church was young, there were certain things that we needed to authenticate that this was actually happening, that, that the word of God was really being received by the Gentiles, that, that God was actually doing a new work and this mysterious plan of God was being fulfilled. We needed all that when we were a kid. But here's what he says. He says, I talk like a child. I thought like a child. I reason like a child. He says, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. 
He says, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. We shall see then face to face. So what's then and now? Paul says then, he says, right now, we're, we're seeing dimly why he doesn't have the Bible yet. The Bible has not been canonized. We don't have the 66 books of the Bible in existence at that time for Paul. So he says, the fullness of what we will know is not there. And remember, the Holy Spirit will bring you into remembrance of all truth. You have to have truth to be brought into remembrance of it. So the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, and the Word of God working together gives us a, a more complete picture. Paul said that hadn't yet happened yet. So we only have partial picture. But he says this, now I know in part, I shall know fully even then, I'm sorry, now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. Here's what he says, verse 13, this is important. And now these three remain. Now of all the spiritual gifts we've talked about, and think about it, we've talked about miraculous healings, we've talked about, we've talked about speaking in a language you didn't learn, we've talked about, and there's so many more miraculous things that happen during that time. But he says, these three, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But then he goes on, he says, but the greatest of these is love. Paul said of everything that you could do, all the spiritual things you could accomplish, even the miracles of healing compared to love, they fall short. He says, right now, these three, what are the three most important aspects, so much more important than spiritual gifts? Faith, that's, that's the belief and the trust of the things we hadn't seen yet. Faith, we have to live in faith right now because we believe God is going to do what He says He's going to do. Je Jesus said, I go away, and when I go away, I'm, I'm going to go away to prepare a place for you, and then I'll, if I go away, I'll come again, I'll receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. That's a promise. We believe that by faith. One of these days, the Lord is going to return with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God. Dead in Christ shall rise first, and those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught together in, with them in the clouds. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Lord wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So we know he's coming back one day. We know that by faith, though. Not by sight yet. Right now, we live by faith. We're looking forward to that day, but we haven't experienced it yet. We will enter into our glory one day. We're going to enter into God's presence one day, but we know that by faith. Then the second thing is hope. What is hope? Is hope wishful thinking? No. Hope is a confident understanding that everything that is not as it should be one day will be righted by God. That's the hope that you and I have. A blessed hope that we have. Then the final thing is this is love. But don't you notice he distinguishes though. He says, but the greatest of these is love. Why is love the greatest? I'll tell you why. It's the only one that's eternal. One day you won't need faith. You, you won't need to believe that one day the sky will peel open like a scroll and the Lord will call us unto himself. You won't need that faith anymore. You want to know why? Because it will have happened. You won't need to have faith that Jesus is who he says that he is because you'll see him face to face. You, you won't need to have faith that those who have trusted Christ and died before us are in the presence of the Lord. You won't need faith for that. Why? Because you'll see them face to face. One of these days, we won't need faith. One of these days, we won't need hope because all the promises that God has given us, He will have fulfilled them and you will have seen them come to fruition. Right now, we need faith and hope, but in the future, we won't. In heaven, you don't need faith in heaven because the Bible says your faith will have been turned to sight. You're not going to be believing something's going to happen that you hadn't seen yet. You're seeing it. So you don't have to have faith when you're seeing it. You don't have to have hope when it's already happened. But what will we still need? That's right. So I want you to think about this. Think about the miraculous things that happened in Scripture. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. That's powerful. It caused a blind man to see. He walked on water, calmed a storm. I mean, think, that's stuff that he did. But, but I forgot my glasses, but I'm going to show you something. It just occurred to me. I might be able to remember it just by... Uh, I can find the book here. It's coming. I can feel it. I need a Bible that's in Braille. Um, when John the Apostle was given the responsibility of helping us see who Christ is, here's what, here's what he said. He said this. So the Word, that's Jesus, became human. He became one of us. And made his home among us. And he, now listen, the first thing he makes note of. Now think about all the things Jesus did. If, if you were John the Apostle and you say, hey, give me the first sentence. If you're going to describe Jesus, how would, what would be the first sentence you'd use? Maybe you'd say, man, he's a miracle worker. Or he's a resurrector from the dead. Or he's a, here's what he said. Here's what John said. He said that, and he made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love. What was noteworthy to John the Apostle about Jesus himself, the first thing he wanted us to think about was he was full of love that wouldn't fail. Unfailing love. Now, here's what's interesting. Paul unpacks this in 1 Corinthians 13. You ought to read it when you go home. 
He says, you know what? If I speak in tongues, but I don't have love, it's useless. If I have prophecies and I, and I can reveal un, crazy, amazing knowledge, I can tell you cool things about God, but I don't have love, it's useless. And he goes through this whole list. I want you to think about that for just a second. Let's say you're in a church and this church is amazing. Man, there's some good teaching there. Pastor, he's awesome or, or whatever. And then, Man, we have great worship and all that stuff, but there's no love in that church? What use is it? Let's say you have a super spiritual church. Woo, man, we got gifts, people. We are gifted. <laughs> but there's no love. Or, or let's say you're a Christian. You got the fish bumper sticker, the whole nine yards. I mean, you're official. But you don't love God. Maybe you act like you do, but you don't actually love Him. What good is it? Say, man, I love God. I just love you, God. But you don't care about people around you. You don't love people. It's no good. See, the atmosphere that everything can operate in as it should, the atmosphere is love. And I'm going to tell you right now, there is no spiritual gift that can overcome an unloving church or an unloving individual or an unloving circumstance. And Paul said the best thing you and I could do, so, so much greater than, than these gifts, is to love. Love God. Man, with everything you got. And let me tell you something, you got to work at that. It's not easy. You can't hold God like you can your spouse or your kids. So I have to keep working to learn and know how to love Him. And I have to drive into His Scripture and read what He said about me and, and hear what He's telling me so that I can really fall in love. That's an ongoing thing. But i got to love God. And i got to love people. God has chosen to express His love to the world through His church. I have a chance to participate. I don't have to look around here and go, hey, this church needs to match my gift. No, what's needed? What's needed? And whatever's needed, God will give you the gift that you need to fulfill it. You'd be amazed. And let me tell you something again. I'll say this again. You will never experience God's favor like you will when you're living for the Lord and He's having you do something that you know you couldn't have done without Him. It's an amazing faith-building experience. Don't miss out on that. Don't miss out on that. Girl, God's changing the world. He's transforming the world. And He's going to give us gifts to do it. Don't pursue a gift. You don't need a gift. You need to love God and love people. And however God wants you to do that, He'll give you what you need. That's what the gifts are. He'll give you the tools. He got, Holy Spirit's got a tool belt. You, you need that? Here, take that. I need that. Get that too, then. Whatever, whatever it takes. You'd be amazed if you just... I mean, you can flunk out of speech class. Still become a preacher. Some of you are like, I see now, I understand. Mm -hmm. So, you can. I want to pray for you and I want to pray with you. Nobody looking around for a minute. Let me explain one thing to you before we pray together. Spiritual gifts, the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, it's only available if we know Christ as our Savior. You, you can't know the, the power of the Spirit of God when Jesus isn't your Savior, when you, he, the Spirit's not living in you. So trusting Christ, turning away from your sin, receiving His forgiveness, all these are critical so the Spirit of God can live in you. And then after He comes to live in you, you're saying, yes, Lord, I, what, what do you want me to do? I'm, I'm in. Then God will give you everything you need. But it starts first with a relationship with Him. If you don't have that relationship, I want to encourage you to have it today. Simple prayer. You can have it right now. Simple prayer. You can just pray silently where you are. Just a prayer. Just something like this. Just, you just say this to God. Just silently. You say, Lord, I need you. I'm lost without you. I'm desperate without you, God. I believe you sent your son for me to die on a cross so that I might know you. Today, God, I put my faith in you. I put my life in your hands. I'm turning away from my sin and I'm turning to you as Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. Teach me how to live. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for this day, God. Thank you for your word. Lord, I'm thankful that there are gifts available, but I'm, I'm more thankful that, God, you've shown us a more excellent way. And that is a way of loving you and loving others that is supernatural. God, help us to live that way, God. 
We don't want to pursue gifts and sacrifice pursuing you, God. We want the gifts you want us to have. So we seek you first, God. We look for what you're doing, and God, we just want to join you in that work, God. And then you fill us with your spirit. You give us what we need to do what you've asked us to do. Qualify us, God, because many times we're unqualified. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all things. We offer this prayer. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. What an incredible message. Thank you for joining us today. If you would like to partner with us in helping spread God's word through your tithes and offerings, you can do that at that.church forward slash give. It's a very safe and secure, easy way to give. So we'd love for you to do that there. And then also we would love to be in prayer for you this week. So any prayer requests or anything that you need prayer over, you can go to that.church forward slash connect and fill out an online connect card there and put them there. And then also we ask that you would share this message with a friend. Thank you for joining us and we will see you next time.